Well, I trust that you are all enjoying our um, Winter is Warming Up series, including book by book and everything that's happening at our 6 p.m. services. It's been absolutely wonderful. This is week three. And uh, before I jump into the word this morning, uh, just to let everybody know that Pastor Sean and Tan uh, this weekend are away in Mossel Bay. They are overseeing the transition of a ministry couple at New Life Church in Mossel Bay, which is a wonderful thing. So that's where they are. And then also... Uh, connected to our Winter is Warming Up series, this evening at our 6 p.m. service, we will be having, having a encounter night where there will essentially just be a, a time of uh, extended worship, uh, an opportunity, just a little bit more breathing room in the service for worship, for prayer, and for ministry time. And so it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. That's taking place at our 6 p.m. service at our Pioneers campus tonight. And so it would be wonderful um, if you have the scope to, to be able to join in on that, it's going to be a great time. Does that sound good? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I have the wonderful privilege of taking us through the book of Job this morning, or the book of Job, as some call it, or as Rudolf told me, the book of Yop. <laughs> but the book of Job, the book of Job. And uh, as we continue in our book by book series, Today And as we jump into this book this morning, I'd like to start us off in a bit of a different way. I'm going to read a note from an author that he gave at the start of his commentary that he wrote on this book. So it's a note from an author who wrote a commentary on the book of Job. And I want to read this to us because I think that this will help prepare us as we approach this teaching today. This is what he wrote. James 5.11, he said, You have heard of the patience or the endurance of Job. Yes, many people have heard about Job and his trials, but not many people understand what those trials were all about and what God was trying to accomplish. Nor do they realize that Job suffered as he did so that God's people today might learn from his experiences how to be patient in suffering and endure to the end. When I decided to write about Job, I said to my wife, I wonder how much suffering we'll have to go through so I can write this book. He said, I don't, I don't want to write or preach in an impersonal or an academic way. The word has to become real to me or I can't make it real to others. Little did we realize the trials that God would permit us to experience, but we can testify that God is faithful. He answers prayer and he always has a wonderful purpose in mind. You too may have to go to the furnace in order to study the book of Job and really grasp its message. If so, don't be afraid. By faith, just say with Job, but he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Gold fears no fire. Whatever we have that is burnt up and left behind in the furnace wasn't worth having anyway. And as we study the book of Job together, I trust that two things will be accomplished in your life, church. You will learn to be patient in your own trials, and you will learn how to help others in their trials. Your word, your world is filled with people who need encouragement, and God may be preparing you for just that ministry. Either way, I hope this book helps you. Should we pray? God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And I pray that we would have open hearts to hear what it is that you have to say to us today. Would you, God, would you just so clearly minister to us this morning as we lean into the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me start off with a, just a short introduction. Um, I was getting ready to go back to gym, emphasis on back. Uh, to gym this week, and uh, it had been about a three-week period since I'd been there, three, maybe four weeks. Uh, there'd been a bit of, we, we all had the flu in the family, as I guess everybody did, and, um, and also did a bit of traveling for work, so wasn't able to have a, a good rhythm, and so it was about a, a long period of time, and so we got ready this week to go back. Um, they say the first rule of CrossFit is to talk about CrossFit, so... <laughs> I'm getting that right this morning. But as much as I love it, what you essentially are doing is you are voluntarily choosing to expose yourself to physical suffering, 
right? That's essentially what you're doing. You are voluntarily exposing yourself. I mean, if you're doing training of any kind, you are voluntarily exposing yourself to physical suffering on a regular basis. And I think we can, we can, I think we tend to do this in life sometimes too. Isn't that true? We, we have to admit that sometimes we can make choices in our lives that can cause us great pain. Um, we can voluntarily expose ourselves to suffering. But sometimes suffering or pain or tragedy come our way unexpectedly and with no clear explanation. It is at times like these that we begin to ask big questions. And what I love about the God that we serve is that he is ready to meet us in the midst of this reality. He is not afraid of our big, difficult questions. And actually, this is a big part of the book, of what the book of Job deals with. In fact, it is the main theme in the book, which is suffering. And so let's just get a quick overview of the book of Job. Quick overview. What type of book is, is it in, in the, the, all the books of the Bible? It is called wisdom literature. There are three wisdom literature books in the Bible. The other two are Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. The title of the book is Job, as we know. And Job essentially is a Hebrew name that means this. It means persecuted, he that weeps or cries out of a hollow place, sorrowful, but one that turns to God. And then the theme, as I mentioned, is suffering. The purpose of the book is this. Number one, it deals with the problem of how suffering can be reconciled with the justice of God. But secondly, the purpose is to show Job as God's example of patience in suffering. And so it deals, in the book deals with some questions. Questions like, how can a good God let bad things happen? Or maybe this one you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Or this is a little closer to home. God, how can you let this happen to me? How can you let this happen to me? And so we're going to take a moment to look at the structure of the book. And as we do that, I'm, just going, to, I'm also going to unpack a little bit of the story of Job. I know that in the room this morning, there are some people who, who maybe know the book of Job well. Maybe you've done a study through it. Maybe you've just read through it. It's a fairly long book. It's 42 chapters, and it's a, it's a bit of a heavy read at times. And um, you know the book well, but there are also many of us in the room who might not know the book well. And so this is your opportunity as I go through the structure of the book and unpack a little bit of the story, just to take hold like on the broad strokes picture of, of this account of Job. Are you ready for this? So structure of the book. The first two chapters are, are sort of a prologue. It's like an introduction. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these two chapters as they really do set up like a bit of a framework for the rest of the book. They set us up. Chapter one begins like this. It's an introduction to who Job was. And we see in this introduction a few key things about the type of man that he was. Job one, it says this, that he was a man of complete integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. It even says this, that Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. It's quite a statement the greatest man among all the people. In short, Job was a very good guy. But he wasn't just a good guy. He was a godly guy. He was a godly person. He lived his life in a way that honored God. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're introduced to Job. And then all, it's, it's like all of a sudden, you're, we're like transported <laughs> And we are taken into the scene, which essentially, it seems to be something, some kind of a heavenly command center where the angels are reporting to God. That's it. Just straight away. Now we're, okay, we're there now. And um, in this section, we witness a conversation that takes place between God and Satan. And as a part of this conversation, God says this about Job. Job 1.8. Have you considered, to Satan, have you considered... My servant Job, there is no one on earth. You see, it's not, just, it's not just the previous verses. God himself said this of Job. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan hears this and he responds with a bit of a proposal. He proposes that Job might not actually love God. And that the only reason that Job is doing good is because God rewards him. 
The only reason he's living in obedience is because he gets the benefit thereof. That's what Satan proposes. He accuses Job of living that way. And so what he does, what Satan does, is he asks permission to test Job, to test him, to see if this testing will alter his trust in God. And and God says, okay. Now you'll need to go and read the detail of what happens next yourself. But in summary, Satan imposes all kinds of suffering upon Job, to name a few things, he loses his house and all his thousands of livestock are destroyed. So his wealth is taken from him. Then to the point where he is unrecognizable, sores break up, break out all over his body. So his health is put at risk. And then it also says that his children die in a tragic accident And so a part of his family is taken from him. And this all happens in chapters 1 and 2, everybody. Essentially what we see here is that Job is a man who fears God but finds himself experiencing unfathomable suffering. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to be in that position? The emotions, the thoughts, the turmoil what it might have been like, I honestly, cannot, I honestly cannot imagine what I would do if faced with such dire circumstances. So that's chapters one and two. Then we get to chapters three to 31. This is the bulk of the book, okay? Three to 31 are essentially a series of dialogues, and these dialogues take place between Job and three of his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and no further. And each, each of these friends turns to offer their explanations for Job's suffering. But it's important to note that their advice was not correct. Their advice was not correct. His friends basically try to offer neat and tidy, well-packaged explanations for the very complex issue of suffering. And they suggest this, that Job's suffering is as a result of something. It must be because of something that you have done, Job. It must be as a result of something that you have done. But even at the very end of the book, God says this about what they said. He said, I'm angry with you and your two friends, the three of them, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. You see, what Job's friends don't seem to understand is the fact that not all suffering is immediately explainable. Each time the friends speak, Job responds to them and maintains that he is innocent. But what we do see in the chapters as they go on is that Job does become increasingly disillusioned. He does. He, he seems to yo-yo between his desire to honor God, deep depression, and then even hurling accusations at God. That's kind of the space he found himself in. And even in his lowest moments, Job asks big questions about the justice of God. He essentially feels that the Lord has turned against him. So that's 3 to 31. Then we get chapters 32 to 37, which is the fourth friend that comes along. His name's Elihu. And interestingly, he is the youngest of the lot. And yet the only one who who seems to speak some sense. Essentially, the truth that Elihu points out to Job is that Job should not be questioning the justice of God. And he introduces the idea that Job, as a mere mortal, does not have the perspective to critique the way the Lord in his sovereignty acts. And we'll hear more about this later on from God himself. And then we have chapters 38 to 41 where God shows up in a whirlwind to respond. He meets with Job. And then finally, in chapters 40, chapter 42, we see Job come to a new revelation and perspective of who God is. God also beautifully ensures that he is vindicated. 
He is proved righteous before his friends. But then he and his friends are reconciled and God like much more, more than restores to Job everything he had lost. And the book ends in this way. It says he lived for 140 years after this and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And then he died old and full of days. And so that's the book in a nutshell. Job suffered. His friends come and offer him advice and critique him. And then he yo-yos between his conviction that he is innocent and then questioning the justice of God. Elihu arrives, speaks some sense, and then God himself meets with Job. And as a result, Job is restored. You see, the book of Job confronts us with this reality, that oftentimes as human beings, we can believe that good works always deserve good outcomes. But that's not always the case. The truth is this, that we live in a fallen world where, where bad things can happen to good people. And here's the key. It's how we respond to this reality that truly matters. And it's in the book of Job that we're given a kind of framework for response. A framework for response. How to respond to the different kinds of suffering that we may face in our lives. And so the question for us today is this. How do we continue to trust God, not just when this happens to others, but when it happens to us? That's the question we're going to be answering today. How do we continue to trust God, not just when this happens to others, but when it happens to us? How do we trust God amidst our suffering? I've got three points for us on this today. Are you ready for these, church? Okay, here we go. Number one, we need to accept that bad things can happen to good people. As I said, as a result of the fall, evil has entered the world and God permits it to act within the boundaries he sovereignly sets. So... This is one of the things that we wrestle with, isn't it? We wrestle with this thing. If we're not wrestling with it, then we just choose to outright ignore it. We try to like hide it away. I don't want to go there. But we have to acknowledge it to be true. We have to. Because if we believe that God is sovereign, then we believe that he is sovereign over all things, but that at the same time, evil still exists in the world. You know, some people may even fall into the trap of believing that once we come to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, that life will only get easier and better. But how many of us in the room today know that that's not quite the case? Firstly, upon reflection, if we look at our own lives, we know this to be true. Most of us, if not all of us in this very moment, are going through something. Something that is difficult. But more than that, we also know it to be true from Scripture. I mean, pick any person who God chose to walk with, who God chose to work with, who God chose to work through. Any person, every single one of them experienced some form of suffering. And then Jesus himself said this to us. He said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This is something that we have to come to terms with, church. I I know we don't want to, but we have to come to terms with this. Why? Because if we do not accept this to be true, then it will ultimately become a hindrance to us trusting in the Lord. We have to come to terms with the fact that bad things can actually happen to some good people. When we learn, when we learn this, Right? When, we learn, when we learn and know this to be true, what happens is that we become a person who is empowered or enabled to navigate better through our own suffering and through the suffering of others as we walk alongside them. As we walk alongside them. Why? Because, because if we understand that these things, that suffering can happen to anybody, then when we go into a difficult situation, we're not just going into that situation trying to find 
reasons and solutions, reasons and solutions. Why is this happening and how do we get out of here? Right, have you, ever, have you ever found that? I guess it's human nature. When, when there's a problem or an issue, we always look for a reason why it's happening and we're always looking for a solution to get out of here. Ever found that? And, and here's, the, here's the truth. It's perfectly normal and important to do that. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not proposing that if you experience suffering in your life that you just meant to sit there and take it. Okay, that's not what I'm proposing this morning. What I am proposing though is that we, what, what I am proposing is that as we navigate through the journey of suffering, continuously asking why is not always a helpful place to live. I'm going to say that again. As we walk the journey of suffering, continuously asking why is not always a helpful place to live. Rather, we need to find a way, and we see this in the book of Job, and I'll read it just now. We need to find a way to help point our friends, our family, our co-workers, and yes, even ourselves, to Christ. And we see this in the life of Job. Job, if you read Job 1, it's actually overwhelming. The man never said a word, at least not a word that was recorded. But it's as though the floodgates of suffering come upon this guy. It's like, what, what, like one messenger after the next, after the next, after the next, just walks into whatever room he was in, in his house, and just say, this, is, this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened, and it's all bad. And he doesn't say a word. The first recorded, the first response that he has to all of this is found in Job 1, verse 20 to 21, and it's a very humbling few verses. It says this, at this, Job got up. So after hearing all of that, this was his first response. He got up, he tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship. Excuse the emotion. It's like, it's like tough to come to terms with or comprehend, isn't it? And he declares, it's the first words of Job in this book. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. But may the name of the Lord be praised. Oh, are you ready for point two? <laughs> the second thing, the second thing. How can we trust, how can we continue to trust God as we navigate through suffering? The second thing is this, is that we need to turn to God with our questions, our misery, <laughs> And our complaints. That's the next step in the journey. It's to find a way to fix our attention and our thoughts on God. This is one of the things that we clearly see Job do. Our initial response to suffering can often be to turn to everything else except God. Or to, turn, or to intentionally turn away from Him. But one of the remarkable things about Job's response is that he chooses to turn to God, and it's something that we need to take note of. What's also important to take note of is this, is, that it is, is the humanity of how this reality plays out in Job's life, and this is so helpful. Job initially responds correctly. He says this, he says, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. That's, that's, so he declares, so he responds correctly at first, but it goes a little downhill from there. And I'm so grateful for that. Aren't you? <laughs> it wasn't like he got it right throughout the whole book. It went a little downhill from there. We see the humanity in all of this. Many of us tend to miss it because we might have only read the first two chapters of Job. Um, but in Job chapter 30, we see Job say this to God. 
He said, He throws me in the mud and I'm reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, but you do not answer. I stand up and you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. In the might of your hand, you attack me. At least that's how I imagine how he said it. (laughs) When we face pain or loss or crisis, a lot of us confront with faith initially. But when the pain or the suffering or the delay continue, oftentimes it can wear away our spiritual resilience. We start by declaring that we trust in God, good thing to do, but oftentimes we end up developing other avenues to cope and we can ultimately end up falling away from God. We have our escapes, don't we? Little escapes, you know, like a, like a good binge every single night that becomes a really bad habit on Netflix or YouTube and then when your significant other talks to you about the fact that you probably shouldn't be doing that, you keep justifying why you can do it. Or maybe it's a little bit more whiskey because life's getting risky, you know, like (laughs) just at the end of the day to take the edge off. Or maybe it's a lot (laughs) to escape completely, you know? I mean, pick your pick your poison, I don't know. Or maybe it's it's maybe it's something like this. Maybe we escape by through excessive activity in our lives. That's that's for different stages of life, I understand that, but but maybe we escape through excessive activity, you know? So it, it, maybe, it's, um, maybe it's escaping to the gym. I mean, gym is a good thing, but in its right place, right? Serving its correct purpose, not as an escape from an, uh, a reality that needs to be faced in those two and a half hours between the evening routine and the time you go to bed with your spouse. <laughs> Just is, don't escape. Face. Maybe it's, maybe it's cycling. I don't know. Pick, pick, pick the thing that you enjoy doing. Those things can quickly become escapes because we don't want to face the reality of like an impending conversation or a difficult thing that we need to address and face. And the reason we escape is because we do not want to face the pain of it. And so we escape it instead of engaging it. And what ends up happening is that we develop the wrong idea of what it means to navigate through suffering. But what did the reality of facing suffering look like for Job? What did it look like? Tim Keller put it this way. He said, Job doesn't sound all that kind and loving and respectful to God, right? But you're forgetting something. Job isn't just talking here. He's praying. He's talking to God. He's complaining about God, but he's talking to God about it. He's questioning God, but he's talking to God about it. And what, that's actually how you ought to handle your suffering, everybody. On the, on the one hand, you do not walk away as if you know better than God on how things ought to be in the world. But on the other hand, you have every right to question. <laughs> you have every right to pour out your misery. You don't sit there saying, oh, I don't want to complain. I just trust God. I'm sure he's working things out for good. No, the book of Job, and this is, great, this is good news, everybody. This is liberating. The book of Job shows that God understands how we talk when we're desperate. Amen? And so what we need to ensure is that even in our misery and our questioning and complaining, we do not turn to everything else. We turn to God. Amen? We talk to God. Have you ever found that when you're experiencing a challenge in your life or difficulty or suffering in your life, you talk to everybody else before you talk to the Lord? Just everybody else needs to know about what I'm going through. Ever been there? What we learn from the book of Job is that we need to turn to God with everything through everything. Because Job turned to God, he was sustained through his suffering. And because Job turned to God, he was restored despite his suffering. Do you know that, do you know that the restoration that took, the key restoration that took place in Job's life was not the fact that he, he received more after all of this had taken place. The, the key restoration that took place, took place before he received back all the things that he had lost and more. He received a new perspective on who God was before he received anything material. 
And so he was restored in his spirit and in his heart and in his soul, despite his suffering. Amen? The third point is this. And we need to, as we continue, as we, as we are, if we are to continue to trust God amidst our suffering, we need to learn to fear God for who he is. One commentator writes this about Job. The foundation for Job's character was the fact that he feared God and shunned evil. To fear the Lord means to respect who he is, what he says, and what he does. It is not the cringing fear of a slave before a master, but the loving reverence of a child before a father a respect that leads to obedience. The remarkable thing about fearing God, Oswald Chambers said, is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. So what does it mean to fear God? To fear the Lord, to live in fear, in the fear of the Lord. To fear God is is not to be afraid of him. To fear him is to hold him in the highest regard and to live before him in awe and reverence of who he is. What's important to note is that when we live in the fear of the Lord, it outworks itself as obedience and honor towards him and worship in our Lives. And we see this in the life of Job. You know, when we look to the account of Job, we can clearly see that Job feared, feared the Lord. We can clearly see that Job lived his life before the Lord in awe and, ref, and reverence. Yes, there were certainly some massive speed bumps along the road. Yes, Job, Job pours out his heart to God in a way that is raw and unfiltered. And, and like we might look at it and go, yo, <laughs> That's hectic. Yes, Job might have lost some perspective. He might even have lost some perspective on who God is, but he never turns away from him. Job never chooses to dishonor God's name. Job lived in the fear of the Lord. And ultimately, the fear of God, which is our awe and our reverence as we live towards him, as we live our lives before him, the fear of the Lord ultimately comes from this, a revelation of who he is. Do we have an understanding of who this God is that we serve? Do we know him? Do we have an understanding of do we do we have a, at least some form of a grasp of just how wonderful and how great he is. As you read the book of Job and you get almost to the end, all the way to chapter 38, what you'll see is this, is that this is the response, this is what God chooses to respond to Job with amidst his suffering. We see Job hurl accusations at God, ask tough questions, lose perspective, like... He just goes through it. That's Job. And God chooses not to respond to Job with specific reasons for his suffering or even solutions as to how to get out. But rather, he chooses to respond with some very powerful perspective on who he is. That's his response. Who he is. And this is so important for us to take note of, church. When we face our lives and the suffering that can can exist within them, our greatest need is not actually a solution to the problem. Our greatest need is not overcoming the issue. This is wild. (laughs) Because if it was, that's what God would have chosen to respond with. Our greatest need is not overcoming the issue or finding answers or seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. What we learn from the book of Job is this. As we face even the most severe suffering that we can face in our lives, our greatest need is God Himself. Our greatest need is to know the Lord and who He is. Our greatest need is to live before God in all 
and reverence, to live in the fear of the Lord. So church, can I encourage you this morning? Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's, it's a good idea to fear the Lord. When, when you face trials and challenges and suffering in your life, can I encourage you with this? Turn to the Lord. When you face ridicule in the workplace, turn to the Lord. When you experience strife in your family, turn to the Lord. And even when you experience personal loss, whether financially or physically or even through death, to turn to the Lord. Because when we turn, when we learn to fear the Lord, we can continue to trust Him through every season or situation or circumstance, even suffering in our lives. Amen. Amen. I'd uh, like to close this morning and read for our sections from Job 38. Is, this is God's response to Job after all this has taken place. And I'd like to read, the, read these sections for us this morning as a kind of a closing prayer. Because this is how God chose to respond to him. And it's just a part of it, how God chose to respond to him. Not giving answers or solutions, but simply giving clear perspective on who he is. So won't you stand with me as we pray this morning? You can close your eyes as I read this. This is God speaking. I love this first line. He says, he says to Job, get ready to answer me like a man. <laughs> God love that. <laughs> get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, Job, will, will you inform me? Where were you when I established the earth? <laughs> Tell me if you have any understanding. Who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. It's almost as though God is being sarcastic with him. <laughs> Who stretched a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning song stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Have you traveled to the sources of the sea or walked in the depths of the oceans? <laughs> Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. And so Lord, I pray this morning that we would be people, that we would be your people. People who turn to you and trust you, people who fear you, which means that we are people who live before you in awe and reverence in every single season of our lives. Lord, may we be those people. Not to get it perfectly right. Not to uh, have well-packaged, perfect little compartmentalized boxes about why everything happens. But may we simply be people who continue to live in the fear of the Lord. People who continue to trust you despite I'd like to just, aff just afford us an opportunity this morning just, just for a, a brief moment to allow God to minister to you in this, in this moment as we've looked into this book of Job. Just to take a moment and bring to mind the, what it is that, what that key thing is. Like in the, in the, in the depths of your heart, you know that's the thing that is a form of suffering that you are experiencing, a, a difficult or experiencing, a difficulty that you are facing in your life. It could be anything. Do not, do not believe the lie now that you need to compare your challenge or suffering to somebody else's and because theirs seems much worse, that yours actually isn't a big deal. So don't believe that lie. Br bring it forth before God right now. Just take a moment to... Say, Lord, this is it. <laughs> this is the thing.
maybe one of the things that you're struggling with is just to overcome like, like a habitual sin that's in your life. That can also bring turmoil. Or, or thoughts, thoughts that you're perplexed by, like constantly, just thoughts that are, are plaguing you. Maybe it's a strange relationship. Whatever it is, just bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, this is it. As we, as we sang earlier, this might need to just be a, something that we lay down again at the feet of Jesus. And as we do that, let's just simply do that. Not looking for reasons as to why or solutions of how we can emerge from it, but just to simply lay it down before Him and then take a moment to comprehend again, to in some way come to terms with, to in some way grasp the magnitude of who your God is I know we say this in church, but like God has got you. <laughs> He's got you. Your next step, your future, the things you're worried about, He has got you. And when we choose to trust Him, we can know that He is trustworthy and faithful. So God, I pray that you would strengthen us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise this morning?